What I'm mostly talking about uh, today is oil infrastructure. And um, I've come to the conclusion over the years of studying these guys because I was an oil trader, I started investing my profits into these infrastructure companies. But I digress. Let's, I'm going to do a little background about energy too, if that's all right. This is, this is us. Now, we manage money for mutual funds and things like that, uh, family offices. And um, so we, you know, we, uh, typically the typical investor is five, 10, 20 million dollars, that kind of thing. At the beginning of 18, we launched the Energy Infrastructure MLP Fund. And I, I basically did it for my own money. So most of the money in there is my own, and we just, just start, started now to make it available to the public. But I did it because I thought it was a fantastic investment. I think these things are ridiculously underpriced. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the industry. And you can come to your own conclusions as to why. But we have a unique way of doing it. I developed a way that I wanted my money managed, and I went from there. This is our firm, uh, not that you're interested in some facts. I'm just going to scroll through a lot of these slides. Um, you're in Chicago or New York? We're in Chicago. So this is, you know, the stuff we've been doing, uh, awards and stuff. Um, okay, I first want to talk about big picture, commodities as an investment. Now. Over the decades or centuries, commodities were a supply-demand thing. There's people who produce commodities, there's people who consume commodities. If the price was too high, there'd be too much production. If price was too low, there wouldn't be enough. If there's demand, supply-demand. But what happened now, in, in the last 20 years, commodities became an investment vehicle. Why? Well, stocks and bonds are all correlated now. You got no... You got no, um, uh, you, you know, you cannot diversify now in those asset classes. How do you diversify? Commodities. So now commodities is an asset class. Well, the world investment, the size of the world investment markets is like a hundred trillion dollars. And it's way too big for the commodity markets. So when commodities are in a lull, okay, nobody invests. But when commodities get hot, some of those trillions of dollars pour into commodities and cause these massive distortions. So commodities go from being a supply-demand market to being a, a, a supply-demand market where there's also hundreds of billions of dollars pouring in, long only generally, into commodities. There's just as an example, I don't know if you know the ETF GLD, and maybe it's, uh, gold is not a good supply demand example, but you can see as the assets increase in the GLD ETF, went up to 70 something billion, um, the price of gold also went up. And, and if you think GLD is not the only ETF and not the only store of gold, as assets pour into these uh, commodities, the price goes up. Not, it has nothing to do with supply demand, it's really a supply demand of money. So you're saying the ETF makes the price of the commodity? Go up, yes. As opposed to the other way? Well, it's, it's, a, it's a chicken and egg. Does the price going up cause more money to flow into the ETF? Or does the money flowing into the ETF cause the price to go up? It's both. But the fact is, when you get the big increase in Usually it goes with the price, so usually you get a bull market. The bull market causes assets to come into commodities, and it's a self-sustaining thing. Assets come into commodities, they drive prices up even more. And then they drive prices up and people go, oh, well, this is a great investment. I've got to diversify, especially when equities aren't doing that well. They want to diversify, so they go, okay, let's, let's buy more, let's buy more. And, uh, and the net result is you get a massive bull market, and you can't even really look at supply demand anymore. You can't even look at what the cost of production is because prices can go so far above that. This is going back to 2008, and this is what we saw, the emergence of long-only commodity funds. 
And you can see how hundreds of billions of dollars came in in a, in a short period of time into long old commodity funds. One of our strategies back in 2007, 8, 9 was we were front running the role of the commodities. So these hundreds of billions of dollars would sit in the front month futures contract and they would roll every month to the next contract. Well, we could take advantage of that from a trading perspective and we did until we started getting quoted in magazines and, you know, I, I, I told Newsweek we take advantage of the dumb money and I don't think they appreciated that so much. But, you know, I uh, can't say they misquoted me, but anyway, um, that's, that's what happened. And so now you see commodities maybe troughing a little bit and maybe ready to head into a bull market and be ready because if they head into a bull market, you can see prices that you think should not belong um, occurring. And it can happen over a period of years. It's not just a one year, you know, one and done kind of thing. This is just an example from the commitment of traders that you can see now that index traders, these are the long only funds, are as big as all the commercials combined. Now, let's talk a little bit about energy. There's a lot of misconceptions about energy, about coal, about electric vehicles and all this. So let's just talk a little bit about it, okay? First of all, oil is primarily used as a transportation fuel. And then you have things like coal and nat gas and renewables that mainly are either for heating or for, and for the power grid. So, so that's what you have. Uh, for people who think that electric vehicles are going to like solve the oil problem, it's not going to happen for a long, long time. Uh, and, and probably the current state of electric vehicles is really not any kind of a solution. Maybe fuel cell vehicles are more of a solution. I don't know if you know anything about fuel cell, but um, in any case, what you're going to see is the demand for oil is going to be increasing over the next 10, 15 years and the demand for natural gas is going to be increasing by even more. Why is natural gas increasing? It's really taking the place of coal. Coal is still big and it's going to remain big. Why? Because power generators, these big plants, if you want to power Chicago, where I'm from, or Shanghai, you need a lot of fossil fuels to do that. You know, you're not going to do it off of windmills. They're, they're incremental to the grid but you need fossil fuels. So coal is a big source of energy and that's why they use coal. They're getting cleaner burning coal, but what they found is in, in places like China where you have a, a, a serious pollution problem, that just by converting plants to nat gas, they can essentially cut emissions by 50%. So they can grow their cities and actually have their emissions slightly decline at the same time. So nat gas, big is going to be a big uh, solution to the problem. Coal is going to be there. Oil is transportation fuel. Now you think, oh, well, electric vehicles and you know, fuel-efficient cars. Look, most of the growth around the world in, in the use of oil is not here in North America. It's in Asia. It's in South America. It's in Africa. It's all these emerging markets where there's one car per 30 families, and it's just going to go up and up and up, and it's going to keep going up. That's why the use of oil goes up every single year. So don't kid yourself if you think that oil's, uh, you know, yesterday's story. It's not. It's going to be here. There's a lot of demand. And right now what we're seeing is the, the demand's not getting met. OPEC hasn't invested in their, uh, in their production. And the only incremental new production is coming out of the U.S., out of shale. Um, just remember... When you talk about oil as opposed to producing soybeans or something like that, soybeans, you plant it, maybe you have new technology, you get a slightly better yield. But oil, when you drill a well, there's a decline curve to that. So if you stop drilling, this is what would happen to, to the oil production. So when, if we're adding a million and a mil, to a million and a half barrels per day of demand every year, we also have to make up for the decline curve, which is probably 4 million barrels per day per year. So that means you need a lot of new oil every single year to meet demand. 
what's been happening is OPEC has have has ha has had less and less excess capacity. So they're essentially using all their excess capacity right now. And where the extra oil has been coming from is shale in the U.S. I mean, there's some other other things going on, but with the price of oil collapsing in 2014 and 15, essentially what was going on is the, the OPEC was trying to break the back of the shale producers, and it didn't work. And they were, broke their own back almost, and they had to give in. So they had to cut production, get prices up, and uh, in any case, here, here's the sort of assessment of where production of oil is going to be over the next coming years. There's a lot of demand for oil. Here's U.S. oil production and sort of the nuances. And in the U.S., the interesting thing, and I'm going to skip forward here, uh, you see the rig counts are going up in the United States, but production's going up a lot faster. And the reason is, is the cost of production's going down. So these are the break-evens in the various shale basins. So the break-evens are going down and down. Why is that? Technology. So they're, they're, they're drilling better wells, bigger wells, faster, for less money. And that's what's making all the difference. So the wells now are producing twice as much as they did a few years ago, and they're drilling them in less time. How about quality of oil? I, mean, I, I sulfur versus low sulfur, and the, and the, and the indication of price and availability Okay, so all, <laughs> the U.S. is in a great spot where almost all the shale oil is light sweet. Light being low sulfur, or low sulfur meaning sweet, and light meaning the API. But in any case, it's almost all light sweet. Now, the funny thing is, U.S. has the most complex refining system in the world. So most of the refiners in the U.S. have converted... When I say complex, it means they can handle high sulfur oil, heavy oil. Why? They make more money if they, if they use heavy oil. It's, it's, it gives them a higher profit margin to have a more complex refinery. So if you talk about the Coke refineries, if you talk about Whiting Petroleum's refinery, um, the Whiting refinery, BP's ref biggest, one of the biggest, these are all, they've been working for years on making these refineries more complex. That means they can take heavy, high sulfur oil and turn it into, you know, gasoline, distillates, all that stuff. So they're in a great spot. Now, there's a, there's a lot of new rules coming in, like IMO 2020 for shipping, that they're not going to allow high sulfur fuels anymore. So it's going to be very important, whoever produces low sulfur fuels, like the United States, light sweet, it's going to be trading at a premium. Now, it, essentially what's going on is because the U.S. refineries are complex, they want heavy oils because it, it, it makes them more money. So they're getting all the heavy uh, oil sands oil out of Canada. It's all coming down south of the border. It's feeding all of the central U.S. refineries. And all the shale production, all the incremental is, is going offshore. It's all heading to the Gulf Coast, being put on ships, and sent to Asia. That's basically what the shale oil is doing. So we're, gonna, we're a big exporter right now of light sweet, and the world needs it. Is there a big play on the transportation, the shipping, is that sort of? Well, the tanker market has gotten a little overbought. Uh, like, they, they built too many tankers in recent years. With OPEC cutting um, production, it's, it's shifted the tanker traffic. So what we, what we talk about is the ARB, the spread between Brent and WTI. That spread is really wide, and it's wide to get those barrels out and exported. So the cost of shipping is about $3. Uh, WTI Brent spread, so Brent is the, is the, uh, the on-the-water price for oil, and WTI is Cushing, Oklahoma. So the di price difference is about set, has been about 6 to $10 for the last couple of years. And, and probably transportation costs are only $3. So they're trying to incentivize the exports. Oh, yeah. Well, actually, uh, I mean, you distill, uh, you distill into distillates, gasoline, 
all the various products, you know, all the molecules. Um, gasoline's right now in oversupply. So there's a big oversupply of gasoline. There's an undersupply of distillate. Um, so I think the refineries are going to be uh, adjusting their systems a little to try to produce more distillate and less gasoline. But right now there's a big oversupply of gasoline and that's causing the refining margins to go down. So the refining margins are actually not that great right now. Even though there's a sense that refineries are going to make a ton of money with these new sulfur requirements. It's going to, you know, the, the more complex refineries are going to make more money. Now, here's LNG. So, like I said, as much as shale oil production is going up, gas production is going up even more. And gas is the hot fuel for the next five or 10 or 15 or 20 years. Okay, everybody wants to use net gas. So essentially what, what you do is you produce net gas, you, it goes on pipes. First of all, it's being used by uh, power generation in the United States. So it's going to these, um, they're switching over from coal. And then the rest of it's going and being converted to LNG. They compress it into a liquid. It's one six hundredth the volume when you compress it. And uh, they put it on ships, like a, I'd say it looks like a big thermos on a boat. And they take it to, uh, to China, to India, to Europe, to wherever, where they, you know, they have um, gasification plants. And essentially that's what's used to, to run the power grid. And all these countries, they want more gas because it solves their pollution problem. What else does? I mean, there's some other things that can help, but um, Germany said they were going all renewables and they couldn't do it. They couldn't do it. They failed. And all of a sudden they had to start using a lot, of, a lot more coal. They said they were going to get away from coal and they didn't. And, and it, it was a disaster because it's kind of hard to get away from fossil fuels because they are a very concentrated source. Um, I got to be honest, I've never understood how the whole ethanol thing works. I know it, it, it's what supplies the octane in the gasoline, and I know we got an ethanol mandate, and I know the corn farmers have a lot of input into that, but it's, it's kind of a big political game, and I don't really understand it. Yeah, I mean, I trade that stuff. We had a report today. Um, the way I look at it, the Chinese, I mean, we, we got this trade dispute, and Chinese have no problem buying our beans and our corn and our wheat, because what they got to buy it anyway, so why not buy it here if it helps the trade dispute? That's not the problem. So I think once they resolve this, Chinese are going to sweep in and buy it all, and the prices are going to go up. Now, we got a lot of supply right now. I mean, we've had some good crops. So... Um, is that I, I don't know how, but I don't know how the ethanol mandate is going to change. Back to LNG, the U.S. supply. How about the Qatari supply? Are, are, you, are you comparing two similar products going to the same market? Yeah. So, um, U.S. is the number three producer in the world. Uh, you got Australia. The Qataris, I think, might be number one. Yeah. Australia. Uh, Russia's coming up too. Yamal, they have a Yamal uh, LNG facility. Um, so there's, let's say, four countries that are producing it all. U.S. I believe has the, if not the cheapest, one of the cheapest sources of 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 natural gas. So they're at a pretty big advantage. We know that C Qatar is going to increase their their uh, exports of LNG. Uh, Russia is, but the demand is, is huge. So I, there's an investment thesis here I think you might be picking up on. LNG shipping companies, like there, there's a lot of different things that you can invest in where you know that this is, is going on and that nothing's going to stop it. Like 
You mean in China? Yeah, so they, they, they liquefy it here in the U.S. I think they are building them. I think, I, I, don't, I forget the names, but there's some plants going on the East Coast. But there's problems on the East Coast because I don't think New York allows any pipelines to cross its territory. So there's problems there. They can't even get Marcellus gas into New York. No, they have underground uh, pipelines in New York. They're, they're, there is, but uh, uh, maybe you know better than me, but my understanding is... Uh, there is actually a grin around New York and you can't have a plant. No, but I'm saying there's existing pipelines, but my understanding is that they're not allowing any more pipelines to be built across New York. So they, they can't get Marcellus uh, gas into New York because of that problem. The black line capacity, what capacity are you talking about? That's, um, I think that's, um, so these are all the different, Sabine Pass, and these are all the different <laughs> Cameron, the black line. yeah, the, 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 that's, I think, um, no, that's not consumption. That's uh, transportation capacity. That's what? Transportation capacity. Transportation capacity. Yeah. Um, that's not tankers because tankers you can. There, there's a lot of worldwide tankers, and you can you can get that. But that now, let me just make sure. Those are uh, so. This is the growth in and all the LNG facilities, all the LNG trains. Yeah, I think that's production. Yeah, so that's, yeah, but it's not production capacity. Now I'm second guessing my own explanation. Because US production of net gas is 90 BCF a day. So this is this is this is LNG capacity, um, and these are the capacity of all the individual trains that are being built. Now, usually when we see a line like that, it's transportation <coughs> capacity, but that wouldn't be shipping. That might be the because okay. So it comes off of production comes off and has to be shipped. Uh, they compress it. They put in a pipeline and they ship it. can only go by pipeline, unlike oil, can go by truck. And they ship it to these trains that are on the coast. They, they then liquefy it and, and put it on the boats. Yeah, and, and, um, but, but there's others coming on. And internationally, there's some big ones. Mozambique is getting FID'd. Um, there's some big ones around the world. But for sure, Chenier has been the biggest and they're getting better and better at it. So they're building faster and faster. So what I've done with my own money and most of the fund that we're infrastructure fund is my own money is look at all these, the infrastructure needs. So you can invest in a producer and I think it's kind of volatile. I, they can make money for sure um, and maybe more money but the infrastructure side, if you build a pipeline, there's so much demand for infrastructure. There's a shortage of infrastructure because the shale growth is going on and on and on. And the infrastructures, that they need infrastructure in every different place. And whoever provides that, the returns are big and the growth prospects are huge. And they get paid on contracts. So a lot of these are take or pay. You build a pipeline. People are signing up for years for this pipeline, and they have to use that space or, or pay for it anyway. So when you do this, and I'm going to get to some stocks. I don't know how much time, but um, when we get to, we still got 15 minutes. Yeah. Um, th there's, there's some great opportunities for companies that return a lot of money, have great uh, returns on assets, and have great growth prospects. So this is what we're targeting. Now, what's going on with oil right now? Just, just so you know, um, the, 
there, there was tightness in the oil market. And then the U.S. Had announced these sanctions against Iran. And they said they were not going to issue any waivers. So they, you know, uh, the administration told the Saudis and OPEC, hey, you got to make up the difference. Then they, they, they filled up ships with, uh, you know, tankers with, with oil, sent them to the destinations where the Iranian was going, and then the U.S. issued waivers to the buyers of Iranian crude. Now all of a sudden you had double the amount of crude at the same time that there was economic weakness around the world, and all of a sudden the price of oil collapsed. I think that's going to... Um, mediate over the next several months. So as you get into 19, um, th that's going to become the, the now the waiver. The waivers are expiring. Raining crude is going to be off the market, and I think uh, OPEC is not too interested in seeing the price where it is right now. What's that? You, you say that um, you don't see uh, electrical vehicles gaining in the future share of the market because the batteries are uh, not being uh, a good source of energy. So uh, I just want to tell you that I, for example, own the Prius. My neighbor owns the Prius. There's also the Leaf and the Volt. Don't you see those cars uh, reducing the demand to transport oil? So, what, I guess maybe I, to make my point on electric vehicles, is there a very small percentage of the market right now? They are probably going to grow rapidly on a percentage basis. But if you look at the total growth, of gasoline or diesel burning engines around the world. If you look at Africa and South America and Asia, electric vehicles will become an increasing percentage. But a lot of that growth is going to be on straight, you know, gasoline vehicles. China will build millions of electric vehicles, but they're going to build tens of millions of gasoline vehicles. So when you look out maybe 15 years, it probably affects the demand of crude oil by two or three million barrels a day out of a hundred and something million barrels. So that is the, 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 the margin of error between an explosion in electric vehicles and just a steady growth is a few, few million barrels a day. In the United States, there's this uh, new trend. Where, I mean, Ford Motor Company has quit building vehicles other than or cars, other than SUVs and pickup trucks. And there's this, this uh, trend towards, uh, instead of buying a vehicle, <coughs> you rent a time uh, of, of utilization. And that would reduce gasoline, because right now, uh, cars sit there 90% of the time in your driveway someplace. But does that reduce the amount of gasoline? Excuse me? Does that reduce the amount of gasoline usage? Yeah. yeah, because you, people are still driving the same amount. They're just sharing cars. So like the whole Uber thing, the whole Uber thing changes the dynamic on cars for sure. And maybe Uber type cars will become more electric in the future. It would stand to reason. Um, I would suggest maybe it would be better if they were fuel cell. When Walmart changed its forklift fleet, I don't know how many they got, a million or something, they use fuel cells. So fuel cells is an electric car, but you're using a, a hydrogen and a catalyst instead of having to charge it. So it makes a lot more sense. Um, well, the other trend is using natural gas. For example, all of those, instead of gasoline, all of the postal, those little things, the postal is running all over the place. They're natural gas. My garbage collector, all of their trucks, waste management, all their trucks are used, using natural gas. And, of, and propane. And propane. Propane's, I think, even cleaner than natural gas. Instead of uh, oil. Uh, right. Uh, gasoline. Right. So I think all these trends are happening, but you have to look at the big picture worldwide. And so there's a lot of trends happening, but big picture, the demand for oil is, is basically going up by a million barrels per day per year. Uh, 
Um, I, when, the, when the sanctions were in before, the Chinese did not quit buying oil. They actually, they didn't increase it, but they didn't quit. They kept it about the same. They have agreements with Iran, and I don't think they intend to change it. What's that? Sure. I mean, people are using this as an advantage, and frankly, I think there's some um, underlying reason for what's going on that really has nothing to do with Iranians' nuclear capabilities. I think there's more to this story, but, but the fact of the matter is, I think right now, that OPEC does not have a lot of excess capacity that Western buyers like Korea and Japan of Iranian oil will not be buying Iranian oil. Um, not only the countries, but because the, the companies that are transporting the oil are afraid of what the U.S. Justice Department will do to them, rightly or wrongly. They will, it's too big a risk for these companies. So they will not take Iranian crude. They'll, they risk the, the, the future of their company. But let's, let's actually talk about some names in the oil infrastructure space. Okay, we have a fund. We do it in a certain way. Um, the way I've looked at it over the years is you have a lot of these companies, and these companies have gotten beaten up in, in the last year or two. But the fact of the matter is, is that these companies have, have great future prospects. And what people are afraid of is the tremendous volatility in the price of crude oil in the last few years, which has made the stock prices of these infrastructure stocks just wild and seem very dangerous. So what we've done is we say, okay, but oil is something we know how to hedge. We can actually make money off of the hedge. So we try to hedge out the oil risk, which is probably 50% of the risk, and just isolate these big yields. And I think when you do that, your, your risk is that oil is going to fall to $30 a barrel and stay there, $20 a barrel. Yeah, then you got a problem. But it can't because around the world, most of the big projects have break-evens well above $50. So you cannot, like, we will run out of oil if oil stays below $50 for an extended period of time. Shale is actually the most resilient. And if you look at, uh, like, the MLPs, for example, people think, oh, when oils collapsed, what happened to distributions in MLPs? Well, they actually went up. Because if you have a pipeline, you're not really as at risk as a producer. When you have a run a gathering system or you sell compression services or all that, it's just a volume-based game. So if you, if you do that, you have long-term good line of sight. This is why I like investing in these companies, because I know what they're spending their capital on, and I know what the demand is for what they're spending their capital in, and I know what they're going to get paid for years to come. You know, so if you build a pipeline out of the Permian now, or, or Kinder Morgan's building a gas pipeline that's opening in October that's going to go to the Gulf Coast, fully sold out for years to come. They know exactly how much. So they're spending all the money now, and they're going to get paid for years. Not a lot of risk to it. I mean, there might be risk in 10 years' time, but the risk is not now. So distribution growth has been steady, steady, steady every year, and is projected to be steady, steady, steady every year. Now, just to see, MLPs, even with all the growth in shale, are trading at one of their biggest discounts in years and years. It's absurd. Now, a lot of that's because of the volatility, but you can get around that volatility. That's what we do. That's our job. We've been crude oil traders for, for two decades. We know how to hedge, hedge the crude risk out of, out of it. So I, I put on some valuations, and it's just very clear that these stocks, even though they stand to grow much more than other industry groups, like REITs or things like that, um, utilities, even though they're going to grow much more, they're paying way more than that. Now, these are the different groups, but I want to get to some names, like uh, SMLP. 
they got a yield of 16.5%. I talked to the management a few times. They said, we've spent a lot of capital and we're going to be growing in 2019. So we have no risk of dropping that distribution, which is a ridiculous 16.5%. Now, usually if you see a company that pays 16.5%, it's because the price is collapsing because you know they can't maintain the distribution. These guys are saying, now they won't raise it because it's too high, but this company's growing. And it's growing and it's paying 16.5%. Now, I'm not suggesting that somebody make this the core of their portfolio. I'm just saying as a piece of the puzzle, you put together enough pieces like this, maybe one, one out of many will not do as well as you expect, but we're talking about a 16.5%. I look at something different. I look at DCF, distributable cash flow. I look at forward DCF. You know what projects they're working on. You can actually calculate what their distributable cash flow is going to be years out. We can calculate. There's companies that have projected distributable cash flow returns of 20, 30 percent when you look out five years. What's the symbol on that? Is there any change? SMLP. With the new tax law, is there any change between the MLPs? There, there's been some changes, and I don't want to get too much into the tax changes. So some MLPs were disallowed, and they have to stop being MLPs within 10 years. Um, but essentially the basic concept, which is the distributions you get are a reduction in basis and, and um, you get a K-1. This is why we do it in a fund, because in a fund we can have like 70 names and we consolidate them all into one K-1. Whereas if you had to do this on your own, you'd get 70 K-1s, it'd be a nightmare. But, but taxation-wise, I think it's, they didn't lose any of their luster in the, in the tax changes, as far as I know. But let me, uh, okay, that's SMLP. TK, so TGP, I love this company. TGP is one of the largest LNG shippers. All their ships are new. They took delivery in the last few years of most of their ships. Everything's under long-term contract. I like that. It's safe. They do have a lot of debt because as they bought all these vessels, they, they put a lot of debt. So what they're doing now, and I've talked to the, the management of the company, the, the senior executives, they're keeping the distribution relatively low. Um, so they pay like 5 or 6%. That's, a lot of people, that's a good yield. But they pay 5 or 6%, but they're generating 20% and by 2023, 30% yield. So what they're doing is they're paying down their debt. They got steady revenue streams. They're producing steady uh, cash flow. They're paying down their debt. So from my standpoint, I look at them and I say, look, they pay down their debt for the next two years. Then they're going to start jacking up their distributions, and this company is going to double in price. Because that DCF yield of 30%, that's absurd. And, it, and they're all under long-term contracts. Here's another of my favorites not offshore partners, KNOP. Okay, so you, you, drill, you drill an offshore well. You put a platform on that well. Are you going to put a pipeline to get the oil out of there? Or you can put it on a shuttle tanker. Shuttle tanker is a specially made tanker that moors up to the oil platform, loads up the oil, and then delivers it to uh, an onshore terminal. Okay, so this is what they do. Because they're kind of specialized, Shell and BP with these offshore terminals, they, they want to set long-term contracts with these guys. They're very specialized, not as probably the second biggest in the world at doing this. And uh, everything's under long-term contract. Everything's locked and loaded. The companies like dealing with only a couple of players who really know what they're doing. So Petrobras and BP and all these guys, they want to deal with them. So they got 100% utilization, and they keep adding ships, you know, maybe one a year, two some years, some years none. And it's, they pay an 11% distribution, but they earn much more than that for DCF, and they reinvest the money. So the company's growing and paying you 11% distribution. And it's stable. It's as stable as can be. So I like this as a core, and it's also different than a pipeline company 
it, it, it's conceptually the same, but it's not correlated, the returns. So it's a good diversifier. Like this. I like this company a lot. Safe. I mean, it'd be, it'd be almost impossible for these guys to go broke or do it, you know, go downhill. Um, there's some riskier, riskier names. This is a spreadsheet we do. We look at these names and we ourselves calculate a forecasted um, distribution DCF. How much cash are they going to generate? Um, my time's up. Uh, how much cash are they going to generate? You want to take a picture of that? <laughs> but I warn you, don't like, be careful if you're going to invest individually. Any last questions before we, before we stop? Uh, it's, it's an LP. If you, if you want my card, you can, we can tell you about it. It's an LP. I think it's a fund. Uh, it's like, I think 50,000 minimum. Um, like I said, mostly, I think I'm like 70% of the money right now. But uh, we, we also get preferential deals now for fee structures. A lot of companies like KMI are converting from MLPs to C corporations. Right. And that, what is your opinion on that? Well, they're doing it because the share prices are too low and it's hard to fund when the share prices are low. So they'd rather be a C corp. KMI did it; was one of the first to do it. It's called simplification transactions. I, it's fine with me. It doesn't really affect our investment thesis at all. Do you favor that? Like HCLP is talking about. They did it. They converted to C. Well, I don't think yet they're talking about HCLP. No, it's been voted. They came to an agreement, and uh, I don't think the transaction has gone through. A lot of people, I own HCLP, a lot of people were complaining they paid too much to buy out the IDRs, the distribution rights. But in any case, they did what they did. Their stock got hit off of what they did. But some companies, the way they're doing it, they're paying too much. It, it's a whole nother conversation, the whole simplification. I, I'm in favor of it in some cases, but companies are doing it for their own best interest, not for the interest of the investors. We just launched this. So I was doing this personally, and um, we just launched it. And MLPs really had a bad year in 2018. We're down a couple percent. So, but the way I look at it, I look at these wild fluctuations in price as an advantage. As a trader, I see the line of sight to what they're going to generate five years down the road. Now, if the price goes way under, I might lose money, but I'm just going to use that as an opportunity to accumulate. So even with the yields, yeah. Okay. Well, we do have some companies that that do not have high yields. So we have some oil service firms that pay no, but I would say we're still yielding seven or eight percent. And even with the hedge, we made a lot. I mean, MLPs and oil services were down twenty or thirty percent, and we're down two percent. So. Okay. What's that? Yeah, so a lot of these companies are way down. I don't worry about that. I know that the price of oil will probably fluctuate between 50 to 80 with brief times where it'll go below 50 and above 80. And uh, my time's up, but I have more time if we can, uh, if you want to have some questions later. Thank you.